Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome again to Everlasting Faith Fellowship Church, and we're glad you have the opportunity to join us today. We're going to continue on our series today about living out your faith. Amen. <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about it's time to collect your reward. That's right. <clears throat> you know, so, so far in our series, we've, we've been talking about practical ways we live out our faith in our in our day-to-day -day existence and uh, today I want to talk about what the end result of our faith is what is the end result of our faith right I mean we're trying to be faithful and so forth for what reason what's waiting for us at the end of this life well as believers in Christ we not only know who we are but based on God's promises Hey, we know where we're going, amen? Now, the Bible has quite a lot to say about the rewards or the crowns that we receive from God while we're still here. However, today I want to concentrate on what it says about the rewards waiting for us in heaven. These rewards aren't based upon what we've done. No, they're based upon what Jesus has done for us. So let's go to his word right now, 1 Corinthians Chapter 9, verse 25. Everybody who competes in games, they're talking about sporting games now, goes into strict training. Of course, we know that, right? And the Bible says they do it to do what? To get a crown, but that crown is, doesn't last forever. However, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. In other words, what we participate in for the kingdom is... Not for some temporary crown, but for a crown that will last forever. Now, the Greek language has two words that mean crown. One word is diadem, which is a king's crown. And it's a crown of sovereign, sovereignty and a person who is royal by his nature, by his position as a king. It's the kind of crown that Jesus Christ wears. Now, the second Greek word is stephanos which is a crown given to an overcomer, a victor, one who has won the race. Now, these are the kinds of crowns available to believers. Why? Because we overcame in spiritual warfare and we're now crowned, amen, at the judgment seat of the Messiah. Now, in Scripture, there's actually five such crowns that are mentioned. The first one is the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. Let's go back to scripture, 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. It says, listen, don't you realize that in a race, everybody might run it, but only one, <clears throat> one person gets the prize. So you need to run to win, the Bible said. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize, right? But that prize fades away. But we do it for an eternal prize. This is a crown given to those who exercise self-control and gain the mastery and the victory in spiritual life. Something we all should be aiming for, right? It's those who have gained the victory over that old man, that old sin nature that we have, right? Those of us who have learned to live a spirit-controlled life, not a sin-controlled life, a Holy Spirit-controlled life. The second crown is the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. After all, it says, what gives us hope and joy? What will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It's you. Wow. This is the crown given to us who win souls for Jesus Christ the Lord, right? And it's a crown available to everyone who does the work of evangelism. We spoke about that all the time. The fruits of their labors are seen in people coming to the Lord through them. It could be as simple as inviting somebody to come and hear the word. Amen? Remember, we can't change them, but it's our duty to introduce them, to evangelize them to the word of God. All right, the third crown is called the crown of righteousness. Let's 
Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Listen, it says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race, and I've remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, hey, he's the righteous judge, it says he's going to give me on the day of his return. And the prize isn't just for me, it says, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. That means me and you also, all of us, amen? Let's go to Romans chapter 4. It says, but the people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. So this is a crown for us who have kept the faith, both in doctrine and morality, in spite of circumstances that we may have gone through in our life. It's a crown given to those whose love is appearing, those who look longingly for the return of Jesus Christ our Savior. Looking for his return is what? It's a result of sound doctrine. It also means we're keeping the faith of his return, right? A life lived in conformance with the New Testament will include the expectation of the soon to come return of the Lord. And as such, there's a crown of righteousness for those who do that. This didn't happen because you did enough good things or because maybe you earned it, no. You have righteousness applied to your account simply because of your faith. Not what you do, but because of your faith, your belief in Jesus Christ. All right, let's go to the fourth crown. The crown of life. Hallelujah. The crown of life. A gift from God. James 1 and 12. God bless those who patiently endure testing and temptation because afterward they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to who? To those who love him. It's a crown for those who endure trials. Maybe you've had your family oppose you on your belief. Circumstances were against you. People spoke against you because you bore the name of Jesus Christ. Some have suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. And some have only suffered a little. But to all who have put it all on the line for Jesus, hallelujah, a great reward is coming. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Don't be afraid of anything you're about to suffer because the devil, he's going to throw you, some of, some of you, into prison just to test you. It says you're going to suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful even when facing death, I'll give you the crown of life. Wow. All right, now the fifth crown, the crown of glory. The crown of glory. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. Care for the flock that God, whoa, has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you're going to get out of it, but because you're eager to serve who? To serve God. Verse 3. Don't lord it over people assigned to your care, but lead them by what? by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you're going to receive a crown of never ending glory and honor. So what is this? It's a crown for faithfully feeding the flock of God. And you can do that in any way. Introduce them to the Bible. Introduce them to Jesus. Feed them spiritually. Amen. It's available to who? Well, to pastors, obviously, to elders, to others who feed the sheep with the milk and the meat of the Word of God. You might do Bible study. You're teaching people the Word of God. Now, there may be other crowns available. These are the ones referred to in the Word of God. And at least five are available to those whose works remain, <clears throat> which were built of gold, silver and precious stones. 
these rewards are for the purposes of really determining the degree of your authority uh -oh, in the Messiah's kingdom. Now we're not talking about eternal order. Because in eternity, all believers, of course, are equal. Nobody is any different than the other. But not so in the kingdom where believers may have different positions in that millennial time period. We have different positions of authority based on what we've received for what we've done. Now, while we might have some minimal understanding, right, of life, life in the here and now, it's really a pale comparison to what the life will be that, wow, that Jesus gives us forevermore. You know, for the first time, for the first time, we're going to know what it's like to live without sin, without disease, without death, without the consequences that fall on us as human beings, right? There's coming a day, I tell you, at the end of this race, when we're going to finally begin to comprehend why this struggle was worth it. It's the day that God gives us, amen, these crowns. And I've discovered, as have many of you, that there is nothing permanent in this life, amen? We know that. There comes a time when that shiny car wears out, food gets spoiled, the hairdo goes out of style, amen? You see, nothing in this life lasts. Everything's coming to an end someday. But glory to God, I said glory to God, there's a crown that God is going to give us, a crown that he promises it's going to last forever and ever and ever. Brothers and sisters, notice that when Paul writes of this crown to the Corinthian church, he mentions those games that are held in the city. But the games were second in importance only to the Olympic, Olympics. So the athlete who disciplines himself and trains hard had a chance to win the competition. And for all that training and endurance, what did he win? He earned a crown that wouldn't even last, right? Because they actually made the crown out of laurel leaves that would wither and die. But Paul promises the Corinthians, and he promises us, right, that the crown that God gives us it's not going to wither or fall apart, amen? Because the crown that God offers, it's eternal. It's permanent. It ain't going away. You see, our home is an eternal one built by God himself for his people, amen, you and me, to dwell in forever. If you're truly a believer in Jesus Christ, this crown will be placed on our head someday. Yes, it will. And as we learned last week, in order to be a winner, you can't be a winner once in a while. You've got to be a winner all the time, amen? In order to be righteous, you've got to be righteous all the time. In order to do the right thing, you've got to do the right things all the time. You see, a winner is a winner all the time. God didn't make us to be losers, amen? God didn't make no mess. A winner focuses on the prize. He keeps on the course. Oh, it ain't easy. Oh, he may have some pain. Oh, but the prize is worth it, I tell you. You see, brothers and sisters, when you struggle to get through this race as a believer, you receive the crowns. You see, there's nothing compared to what Christ went through, right? And over these last few weeks, we learned that God, He has given us great potential. That's right. He's given us special gifts, right? Spiritual gifts to be used not for our glory, but for His glory. And He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit in order to be successful. He didn't just do that for no reason. He wants us to use these gifts. He wants us to use them responsibly. He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to do His work. He wants us to raise Christian families. And He wants us to depend on other Christians. And when I say Christians, I'm talking about believers in Jesus Christ. Amen? Not just the title Christianity. I'm talking about actual believer. He wants us to be winners and not losers. And finally, he wants us to stay focused on the big prize to come 
as we continue to serve him in the here and now. Listen, before I close today, I want to read you a parable that Jesus used in order to let us know that we need to use the gifts he has given us responsibly. Now, there's a lot of verses to it, but I think it's worth listening to. Amen? Let's go to Luke chapter 19, verse 11. I don't think I have it on here, but let me read it to you. Verse 11 says, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. And because he was near Jerusalem, the Bible says, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once, here's what he said. Jesus said, listen, a man of noble birth, he went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to come back. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. He said, put this money to work. Put it to work till I come back. His subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him and say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to, servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out how much they gained with it. First one came and said, sir, your mina has earned me 10 more. He, he said, well done, my good servant. His master said, because you have been trustworthy in a small matter, I'm going to let you take charge of 10 cities. Okay, the second man came in and he said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. He said, Okay, you can take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mina back. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth and I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did and don't put in and reap what you sow. His master said, Listen, I'm going to judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Then why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to everybody that was standing by, Take that guy's mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. And he said, listen, I tell you to everyone who has, more will be given. But the one who has nothing, even what he has, is going to be taken away. What are we talking about here? Jesus' rewards await us. The crowns we spoke of today await us at judgment day. We're going to receive rewards based upon what we've done. Amen? Just like that thing said, those who have nothing ain't getting nothing. If we ain't done nothing, we ain't getting nothing. We're going to receive rewards based on what we've done as a result of our faith in Jesus Christ and the gifts he gave you to accomplish his will. You see, he's given us th those things, right? Not just to put in a claw somewhere and save them. No, he wants us to put those to use, like the man who came back with 10. But you might say, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought everybody was equal in eternity and that some didn't have more rewards than others. Well, you are entirely correct. Everyone will be equal, but the rewards we spoke of determine the position of authority that you're going to take during those thousand years in the millennial kingdom. A period before eternity begins. It lasts for a thousand years. And after the millennium or messianic kingdom, Satan is going to meet his final abode along with the great white throne judgment and the creation of a new heaven and new earth will take place. It's time to get in the race. It's time to start training. It's time to start using all that we've been blessed with. It's time to take the reward. They're waiting for us, but we've got to win the race. And you can't win it if you ain't in it. Amen? The altar is open. Let's pray. 
Father, we just thank you, Lord. We just thank you so much for everything that you've given us in order to accomplish your will in this life and to help us accomplish our goals that you've set for each and every one of us. And we ask that you would help us <clears throat> to put those gifts that you've given us to use and not put them away and save them for some, some rainy day or, or from time when you come back. No, you want us to use those things for the glory of the kingdom. Help us to do that so that others may too receive the gifts that you have waiting for them. They can't receive it if they don't know about it. And you gave us a job to go out and let them know about it. Help us to do that, Lord. We thank you right now in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you all. Thank you for listening in today. I'm sorry that scripture wasn't on there, but you can look it up when you get back home. Amen. All right. We'll see you all next week. Be safe. And start doing the job that God has appointed you to do. Amen. Amen.